Hoosiers helping Hoosiers across central Indiana. These are our friends and neighbors on 95.5 WFMS. Hey, 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 Steve Stewart here and got another guest here for the WFMS Friends and Neighbors Community Show. Joining me this morning is Kyle Bononi, the founder and CEO of the Tour de Coman, Inc. And uh, Kyle, good morning to you. Good morning to you, sir. Hey, man, sure appreciate you taking some time to chat with us a little bit. And uh, we've got a lot to cover, the Tour de Coman, the uh, Susan G. Coman Foundation. But I really want you to kind of share your story with our listeners to uh, kick things off and kind of it's it's how the Tour de Coman got started. So let's head back to when you were a kid, Kyle, you know, uh, eight, nine years old. And tell us about your mom's battle with breast cancer. Yeah, so uh, she got uh, breast cancer uh, early on in my childhood. I think about eight years old. Um, was able to beat it the first time, and then it came back um, and caught it too late. So I ended up losing my mom, Peggy, uh, to breast cancer when I was just 12 years old. Okay. Um, that also happened to be the first year that the Wabash Valley Race for the Cure um, with Susan G. Komen uh, came to Terre Haute, uh, where I'm from, where I grew up. Um, so we we decided to, uh, my my dad and immediate family decided to start a team. Um, and we've been fighting and fundraising with Susan G. Cohen for the past 27 years. Wow. Yeah. And we will get to that here in just a few. And when you say you first got a team together, it wasn't a bicycling team, was it? No. So we, um, we joined the, the race for the cure. So it was a run walk 5k. Uh, yeah. So we did that. Uh, and we still do that every year. Um, but it wasn't until, um, you know, I got a little bit older. Uh, my, my dad kind of managed, you know, recruiting and, and fundraising early on. And then once I got a little bit older, um, my late teenage years, I kind of took off, took a more, you know, heavier role with it. Um, tried to get more of my friends involved. I went off to college. I was networking there. Um, and then I ended up winning uh, a couple of awards throughout the years in, in terms of largest team fundraiser. Uh, largest registered team and so every year I was trying to repeat that Um, and it was one year that I came down off uh, the stage from accepting largest team fundraiser in 2016 and a lady stopped me and said hey thank you so much for uh, all the money that you're raising for Susan G. Komen I really appreciate it and I you know said no problem Uh, my pleasure and she said no I don't think you understand the money that you raised, I was able to tap into those funds to detect, treat, and now beat my breast cancer. I'm cancer free. So at that point, I kind of realized, you know, what we're doing is really impactful. So right. I decided to uh, just understand that and, and know that next year I had to do something even bigger and better than what I've been doing. So I was out on a, on a bike ride um, in 2017, uh, just started bike riding, wasn't even on a road bike, just a hybrid uh, with my cousin-in-law, if you will. And we were talking about, you know, how, how can we make um, the race for the cure more impactful? And, you know, I thought my dad lives out in Riley about 10, 15 minutes from where they had the race for the cure in, in the Wabash Valley at the time. And, and I said, you know, we could ride from my dad's house to the, to, the, to the race, run the race, ride back, swim across the lake in the neighborhood, make it a little mini triathlon. Uh-huh. And, and Will Rayner said no let's ride from here to the race. And I said, that's what I'm talking about. We'll ride. And he said, no, from here in Fishers to Terre Haute. And I'm a super competitive guy uh, my whole life. So I just decided let's do it. We're on. And so just seven of us, uh, basically just family and and very close friends started uh, just seven of us out of my garage in Fishers at the time. Um, And now here we are in the seventh year of the two are coming. Wow, what a story. And um, so sorry to hear about your mother, Peggy. And you also lost your aunt, Judy, correct? Yeah, she had had uh, breast cancer. Um, and then I believe it, it, it um, metastasized and moved into another form of cancer that she had eventually succumbed to. Speaking with uh, Kyle Vanoni, he's the founder and CEO of the Tour de Coman, Inc., uh, everything we're talking about today, you can catch at the website, www.tourdecoman.org. 
And uh, we're also talking a little bit about the uh, Susan G. Komen Foundation. You can find their website, www.komen.org. And uh, the mission of the Susan G. Komen uh, organization is to save lives by meeting the most critical needs in our communities and investing in breakthrough research to pre- prevent and cure breast cancer. And Kyle, um, since losing your mom and your aunt and being impacted so much by breast cancer, you've kind of made that your life's mission as well, correct, with the uh, Tour de Komen? Yes, yes. So Tour de Komen uh, currently donates 100% of all the funds we raise uh, straight over to Susan G. Komen um, through the More Than Pink Walk uh, that we that used formerly used to be Race for the Cure. Uh-huh. Uh, but then after the Tour de Komen, we do... We participate in the more than pink walk out in the Wabash Valley, and I also do the uh, the one here in Indianapolis uh, downtown as well. Um, but we we funnel all of our money through their their walk fundraiser. And a couple facts I saw about breast cancer online: about thirteen percent, or one in eight women, will develop invasive breast cancer in the course of their life. And breast cancer, one of the leading causes of cancer related deaths to women here in the United States. I mean, it's second only to lung cancer. So yeah, what you're doing, definitely impactful, definitely making a difference. And now would you repeat over the past um, 27 years, how much money have you raised for the Susan G. Komen? Between uh, just fundraising for the, the race for the cure and the more than pink walk. And then also the tour to Komen. and, Roughly $350,000. $350,000. So hats off to you. And let's uh, let's chat a little bit more about your fundraiser that's on the way here. Again, I'm speaking with Kyle Vanoni. He's the founder and CEO of the Tour de Komen, Inc. And, um, of course, raising money for the Susan G. Komen Foundation. And how many years have you been doing the actual Tour de Komen? Uh, this is uh, year seven. Okay, that's what I, I thought you said. Year seven, and you've mentioned you raised three hundred over three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, just amazing. So, tell us more about the Tour de Komen. I mean, when it's happening, where it's happening, and all that good stuff. Yeah, so uh, the Tour de Komen is a hundred mile cycle from Fishers, Indiana, to Terre Haute. It's on September twenty third, uh, but registration ends August eighteenth. So Friday, August 18th, registration ends, and the bride is on Saturday, September 23rd at 9 a.m. We take off from uh, roughly 116th and Allisonville and Fishers, and we finish at the Mill, uh, Terre Haute, which is a concert venue um, in, uh, close to downtown Terre Haute. And it's a 100-mile it's a ride, but some really unique things that make our ride so much different than any other ride out there is that one, a lot of rides you just you sign up, you register, and you ride, and you finish when you finish. Some are races, some are not, uh, but you finish when you finish. Uh, our ride, um, we all ride together, mm-hmm. and the reason why we do that is because we're trying to emulate how you beat breast cancer, and nobody does it alone. They do it with their family, their friends, and their community. So mm-hmm. that's why we all ride together now. I will say that it is a an 18 to 20 mile an hour average uh, over the course of 100 miles. So you do have to be an avid cyclist. You do have to uh, opt in um, to a checkbox when you register that you've sufficiently trained for uh, an 18 to 20 mile an hour average. Um, you know, we also want to feel like you you battled something that day. Like you have pain in your legs from going up the hills on US 40. Um, you kept a hard pace the whole day. So that we really feel like we accomplished something. We really beat breast cancer that day. And it also, for any of the survivors or folks that are battling cancer in the midst of it to hear about our story, um, you know, they can be inspired that, wow, as a whole group, they were able to, to do it together, hold that pace, and finish the 100 miles together. A few other things that make us really different is that we have a police escort for the whole 100 miles. So it's amazing that we're able to um, – have these great partnerships with Fishers PD, uh, Carmel PD, Boone County Sheriff, Hendricks County Sheriff, Putnam County Sheriff, Clay County Sheriff, and Vigo County Sheriff departments that all work together uh, to hand off the police escort uh, from county to county from start to finish, keeping us safe, letting us flow through all the roundabouts and stoplights. Um, it's an amazing, inspiring experience. What time does it start, Kyle? Uh, it starts at 9 a.m. 
9 a.m. Starts in Fishers, ends in Terre Haute, 100 miles. What kind of time are you talking? Would that be five or six hours? Yeah, roughly six hours. There's four uh, supported SAG stops, with one of those being a lunch stop. Um, so we keep you fed. We keep you hydrated. Um, we've also got uh, the jersey that is different. Uh, most most rides you wear whatever you want to wear, but we require everybody to wear the pink jersey that's included with the hundred dollar registration fee. Uh-huh. Uh, we look like one big pink blob going down the down the uh, road that catches a lot of people's attention. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and how would you uh, get involved? You, you mentioned it's a hundred dollar f- uh, fee to get involved. Uh, where do you go? Just to the website? Yeah, website, www.tourtocoman.org. There's a button right there on the homepage to click registration. There's a video that shows what it's all about uh, from our 2019 ride when uh, Hall of Famer and Indiana great Reggie Miller uh, from the Pacers <laughs> yeah. rode with us as well. So uh, it's been quite the ride with Tour de Coman. Oh, very cool. And again, all that information. If you're uh, just tuning in right now and you're thinking, wow, that sounds cool. I'm interested. Uh, again, the website is www.tourdecoman.org. And uh, we'll let you know how to do that. And if, you, uh, if you're saying, hey, I'm not available that day, uh, I can't keep that pace. Because, again, you've got to be an experienced cyclist uh, to do this because it's a 100-mile it's a cycling event, about six hours. And you, get, you said about a 12 to 18 mile per hour. Uh, pace about 18 to 20 we usually 20. end up finishing at a, close to like 19 and a half 20 miles an hour for the okay ride. But, but and if that's not you but you're thinking wow i really admire this guy i love what he's doing uh i've been affected by breast cancer maybe a member of my family or possibly even yourself how would they donate kyle uh they go on tour to coman.org slash donate um you can donate right there Another great way to help support us is to go to our Instagram Tour to Komen or Facebook Tour to Komen page and share, uh, share that with somebody that you do know that is an avid cyclist um, because we're trying to reach our ultimate goal of 100 riders someday. Uh, last year we came close. We had 78. Ooh. This year we have 35 registered right now. But uh-huh. then again, uh, registration closed on, on August 18th. So uh, we're looking to uh, make a run here at 100, 100 cyclists. Okay, so if you're listening this morning, you're interested, again, www.tourdecoman.org. And there's also volunteer opportunities that day, right, Kyle? Yep, they're at the bottom of our uh, webpage. There is uh, a link to click on volunteer, and you can fill out a volunteer form, and then we will be in contact with you to see if uh, one of our four SAG stops uh, fits your area so that you can help us, um, you know, hand out food and, and beverages, supply coolers and ice and all those great things. Okay, again, the event is the Tour de Coman, Saturday, September 23rd. They will start at 9 a.m. in Fishers, Indiana. They will end up in Terre Haute, Indiana. It's a 100-mile cycling event to raise money for the Susan G. Komen Foundation. It's about six hours, four stops along the way. The fee is $100 to participate. All the information at the website, www.tourdecoman.org. Again, my guest this morning, Kyle Vanoni. He's the founder and CEO of Tour de Coman, Inc. And Kyle, best of luck on the 23rd. I hope you have a big day and keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate the time. Hoosiers, helping Hoosiers across central Indiana. Find more information about how we can support your charitable organization or promote an upcoming event at WFMS.com. These are our friends and neighbors on 95.5 WFMS. And good morning, it's Jim Denny here with Friends and Neighbors Program. And our guest this morning is the founder of Taffy's Touch Senior Dog Rescue, Nikki Sanders. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you by. This is this particular program that you've put together is very near and dear to my heart because I've had to actually utilize you at a time when I, I needed to get rid of a dog that was older that my mom just could not take care of. And I know you get that all the time. And you so quickly found me a foster care. And the great thing is the foster less than a week actually adopted Sissy. So that was a, that was a great story. Yeah, she did, and that happens quite a bit with our fosters. They fall in love and end up adopting them. Well, you can't. You look at the pictures on your or your uh, Facebook. You can't help but uh, fall in love with them. Well, tell us now, how did you get started with the uh, Taffy's? What made you do this? Your inspiration? Well, actually, it was in the middle of the pandemic when we were all kind of stuck in our house. Um, I decided out of nowhere I wanted to foster a senior dog, um, so I ran across Taffy. Of course, she was just a little blind red Pomeranian, 14 years old. 
Um, so I pulled her out of a shelter and fostered her at home. I had her for about three months. She had cancer. Um, so when I lost Taffy, it, it just dawned on me that I needed to keep doing this, but in, in a bigger way um, and help more of these senior dogs to get out of the shelter and into the home environment. Right, because I know you mention all the time on Facebook about the the shelter is just not it's just not a good place for a uh, for an older dog because they're they're scared they maybe had a lifestyle differently and you now you're just trying to find a loving home for them. How tough is it though? And this is the one thing I think is so great about you. It's got to be so tough, and you've you posted this before uh, to get mm-hmm. a dog knowing that they're maybe not going to last long. Some do, but some of them just mm-hmm. don't aren't going to last that long. How tough is that? You know, it's extremely difficult, but so often I have to remind myself that it, it's not about me. It's not about how hard it is. It's about that dog and what they need at that time in their life. So um, it's a very selfless thing that people do. And when you try it, you end up loving it. And then whenever you go through the loss of losing that dog that you've fallen in love with, it opens up a spot to save another and then another. And then it just keeps going and, and then you end up loving doing it. That's true. Now, do you, uh, how do you get your dogs? I know some of them are, you know, in my case, I had to kind of surrender and you guys took care of it. Do you go to the shelters, though, and just try to find the, the dogs that need it? Uh, you know, a lot of the local shelters in Indiana and surrounding states, they will contact me whenever they have senior dogs that are in need there. Occasionally, I will see them myself and approach the shelter. Um, we do take age eight and older, so the shelters know that, so they'll reach out to me when they have a dog in need. Um, and then kind of similar to your situation, you know, we get a lot of owners that are moving into a nursing home or assisted living or passing away and they don't want their beloved pet to go to a shelter. So they'll call us uh, and then we'll work on finding a foster home for that animal. Well, I know you've had a lot of uh, success stories and you've had some sad ones, too. And you've uh, been left in tears many times reading some of the stories, especially when you find out that uh, someone has maybe uh, fostered or adopted a dog for one day and then they turn it back in. And that's got to be real tough on, on you and the dog as well. But uh, uh, how, how do you well, I'm trying to see it, Let's. Uh, how do you vet the fosters and, and the, uh, the forever homes? Yeah, so how it works is, um, you know, we cannot commit to pulling a dog out of a shelter until we have a committed foster lined up because we don't have a facility. We rely only on foster homes for these dogs. Um, So it's very important that when people foster that they continue to foster until that dog gets adopted. And for the entire duration of the foster period, the rescue covers all the vetting needs. So we would schedule the vet appointments. The foster just has to transport the dog to those appointments. And then the vets call us for payment. And that, you know, we get every dog microchipped, all spayed, neutered if they're not already, vaccines done. We get a lot of dentals, mass removals, heartworm treatment, all kinds of um, just medical needs that our dogs have. We take care of all of that before they're adopted out. Now, you have your veterinarians, uh, but it still costs money, obviously. Um, oh, yeah. how, how do you get your donations? Is it just through word of mouth, through the, the, the website, your uh, Facebook? Yes, it really is word of mouth. Um, a lot of social media, we're on every platform, and then our website, too. So it's we do events from time to time, you know, different farmer's markets and T-shirt sales and different things like that to raise money. But we are 100% donation-based. Yeah, I've got the uh, this year's calendar, by the way, <laughs> hanging on my fridge yeah, at home. But so that's good. Um, we talk about success stories as well. To um, I know there's one that I just recently saw where the dog Sky uh, is it was yeah. just no one and no one was really paying uh, interest in Sky, but Sky right. is a beautiful older dog, great health, and Sky just now I believe just got foster. You know, it really takes a special person to take in an old dog, just in general. But our bigger old dogs are extra difficult to find placement for. Um, For one thing, the bigger the dog, the less the life expectancy usually. Um, And a lot of people just want those cute little fluffy dogs, which we do get quite a few of those too. Um, But the bigger ones are are really difficult. And Skye, you know, was a medium to big dog. And she had some anxiety going on when she would meet new people. You know, that kind of comes with the territory of coming from a shelter sometimes. Um, so she had quite a few failed meet and greets where she didn't show too well. And so people were passing on her. She was with us for quite a while and finally just found her right people. And that's how it always happens. You know, it's just meant to be. And then they find their forever home with the people that they're meant to be with. 
So what is the, what's the process for, uh, if you want to foster or if you want to adopt a pet, I mean, what, what's the process that you go through in order to make sure it's a, it's a good fit? Correct. Yeah. There's an application on our website for both fostering and adoption. Uh, we have a volunteer that calls references. If the person is renting, we follow up with the landlord to make sure that it's okay. Um, just because of timing constraints, we've been doing home visits virtually, like uh, via uh, video and pictures, checking out the home, and then we will do a meet and greet uh, prior to the adoption as well, just to make sure it's a good fit. If the person already has other pets, we want to make sure that our dog and their dog gets along well and whatnot. So we, it is quite a process. Yes, I was going to say, because you, I mean, do you actually physically go out sometimes and check out the homes? Yes, I do. Okay. Because mm -hmm. some some dogs are going to obviously need a fenced in yard, and probably in most cases you'd prefer it, but uh, it's not always necessary. But uh, you look for that. You look whether it's two story or a ranch, just for the dog. Because some of your dogs yeah. obviously have some walking issues. Yeah, it it completely depends on the dog. So we get quite a few of your typical lazy old dogs that <laughs> really just want to lay on the couch with you or lay by your feet. You know, I'm not going to require you to have a large fenced in yard for those dogs. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of our dogs have arthritis or just joint issues, so stairs might be an issue. But then we have dogs like Skye that can run around and jump fences if she really wanted to. So it really just kind of depends on the dog. Um, so every situation is a little different. Well, uh, uh, give me an example of what you'd consider. You, ha you had a bunch of mine with about success stories that you had maybe recently uh, where you got just the right fit, you know, a dog that maybe you didn't think we were going to find a home. Yeah, you know, since I started this almost three years ago, I have not had a dog not get adopted. So, you know, so far it's been close to 350 seniors that we've been able to save. Wow. Just from various situations. Um, you know, quite a few of those dogs end up being, you know, what we call hospice dogs or forever foster dogs to where if a dog has really chronic medical issues, severe heart disease or even doggy dementia, different things like that, we're not going to adopt those out because people aren't going to necessarily want to pay that lifelong cost, you know? Right, um, right. So a lot of those dogs in that situation, we keep as the rescue for life, and we cover those vet bills for life, however long, however short that may be. Wow. Um, but outside of that, you know, all the other dogs have landed in their forever home. Um I honestly, there's so many good success stories where we've had just dogs find their perfect people. Um, we get a lot of, you know, senior citizens adopting our senior dogs as well. And that really tends to work out. You know, they're just looking for a companion, somebody to hang out with all day. And, um, you know, a lot of our dogs just fit that need. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's got to be just the right fit because some dogs are, I'm sure you see this, are fine to be they're at home alone for a few hours and some of them just are just they, they can't do it yes yeah uh, you know like i said we do get quite a few of your lazy sleepy dogs that could sleep all day long they don't <laughs> care if you're hey, I'm home like or at work all day yeah <laughs> um, and then we do get our fair share of dogs that have some separation anxiety too so those people that work from home or maybe are just gone a few hours a day those are at the ideal home for those dogs Okay, I sometimes, I sometimes see on your, your Facebook, you say, hey, we're full right now, uh, if anybody can help us. Yeah. Uh, by full, I mean, do you actually house these dogs at your home or a facility? So I do house quite a few of the dogs against my um, husband's blessing. Um, <laughs> I do have quite a few dogs at my house most of the time. Um, but usually when I post that we're full, it's related to funding. I don't want to take on more dogs when we have current dogs with medical needs that I can't even cover, you know? Sure. Um, I usually have 20 to 30 dogs at a time just in the rescue in various foster homes. And if most of those dogs are heartworm positive or need mass removal, that's going to take a lot of our funding down. So I can't commit to more dogs at those times, which is right now. I'm kind of at a holding pattern right now. Um, so many of our dogs right now have medical needs that I need to address before I commit to taking other dogs that I won't be able to really help. I see. Um, and as far as fostering goes, how many fosters do you think you have uh, maybe right now? Um, I've got 30 right now. Okay, okay, that's what you mentioned, okay. 
Yeah, uh, and, you know, I'd say about 10 of those are like a forever foster, meaning those dogs are not adoptable. They're kind of in a hospice situation. Gotcha. So probably 20 of those are going to be adoptable here soon. I see. Now, if uh, what are your biggest needs? Obviously, donations, you'd say? Yes, for sure. Just to kind of help with those vetting needs that we talked about. Um, other than that, you know, I provide uh, things like leashes, collars, harnesses. If a dog needs a crate or a bed, dog food, all of those things are provided to our foster homes if they're needed. You know, some foster homes will say, no, don't, don't worry about it. We've got what we need. But a lot of foster homes need those supplies, so we will provide those as well. So any kind of donations on dog food and supplies is always helpful. Okay, now how do they how would they contact you? Would it be through your website, or is it uh, just to message you on Facebook? What's the best way to get a hold of you in order for someone that says, hey, "I want to volunteer my time"? I know you need runners sometimes to go get dogs at different yeah. par- uh, portions of the state, uh, or just to donate some money. Yes, yeah. So transportation, you brought up a good point. That's always a huge help too that we need volunteers for. Um, we do pull dogs, you know, sometimes from Ohio, Illinois, Kentucky, and so. Um, with me working full, full time, in addition to doing the rescue, it's, it's kind of limited on my timing on when I can transport. So that's always a huge help. Um, but it, the best way to contact me is really probably through the website. There's just a contact us page on www.taffystouchrescue.com or you can email me um, or the Facebook message, like you mentioned, is, is a really good way. Okay, so it's taffystouchrescue.com? Uh, yes. Okay, and that's where they can contact you to maybe to donate. And I know we've got some things coming up in the future that I'll share later on uh, as far as a chance for you to, to donate and all. But, uh, hey, I really appreciate you taking the time and joining us here this morning. And uh, uh, don't ever quit, quit, because I know sometimes it can be so frustrating, uh, you know, what you do, because just the way things work and trying to get things to work. Because you do work. You're working full time as well. But please don't quit. You're doing such great work for these dogs. No, I definitely don't plan on quitting. I, I truly feel like this is my life's mission, so I don't plan on quitting anytime soon, even when it gets really, really hard and I feel like it, I won't. <laughs> oh, the, okay, I got you. Nikki Sanders joining us, uh, Taffy's Touch Senior Dog Rescue. Get in touch and tell us about your charitable organization or upcoming event at WFMS.com. This has been a Friends and Neighbors Community Show. Thanks for listening.